Good afternoon and welcome to this panel focused on defining resilience in the context of the blue economy on the third and final day of the IDB's One Region, One Commitment Summit. My name is Winsome Leslie, CEO of Dev Solutions Consulting and a former senior staff member at the IDB. Some of my best career memories are from the bank and so I'm extremely pleased to be moderating this session this evening. This summit has been highlighting the tremendous support being given by the IDB group to countries in the Latin American Caribbean region to promote climate resilience. And as the opening video on restoring blue carbon has shown, it involves innovation and creativity. In addition, the summit has also been bringing to light new areas for engagement and collaboration between public and private sectors, NGOs, and the international community towards sustainable and inclusive development. Much of the discussion so far has centered on climate resilience and a green recovery. This panel will now shift the focus to the blue economy based on the premise that marine and coastal assets have to be an integral part of the building back better effort in a post COVID world. Climate resilience and the blue economy are intimately linked. John Kerry, the US special presidential envoy for climate has said that you cannot address the climate challenge without focusing on protection and sustainability of the blue economy. And you cannot adequately protect the blue economy without addressing climate change. This speaks to the feedback loop between ocean degradation and climate change. As such, countries must effectively integrate the protection of ocean and coastal ecosystems and other blue ocean strategies into their climate resilience agendas and with due attention to their commitments under the Paris Agreement. We all know that the blue economy has been hit hard by the pandemic with negative impacts on workers and small businesses in the tourism sector, those in the tourism value chain, on fishing and shipping, as well as on local communities. The effects have been felt disproportionately by countries with significant ocean resources and the small island developing states in particular. However, the good news is that the blue economy also holds the key to sustainable recovery and resilience for these countries. A key question we need to ask ourselves is, what does resilience really look like in the context of a blue economy approach to sustainable development? The high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, which includes Jamaica, Chile and Mexico from the LAC region, highlights five actions that governments ought to take to build resilience and to support a blue economy. First, investing in coastal and marine ecosystem restoration and protection. Second, investing in sewage and wastewater infrastructure for coastal communities. Third, investment in sustainable community-led non-fed mariculture. Fourth, incentivizing zero emission marine transport. And finally, incentivizing sustainable ocean-based renewable energy. Activities such as these will have a positive impact on job creation and economic development. But equal attention must also be placed on the sustainable aspect of the blue economy. Indeed, issues surrounding the blue economy, such as challenges, opportunities, its link to resilience, must be an important part of the discussion at COP26. Close collaboration between stakeholders, both within and between countries, will be important as well. Selwyn Hart, Assistant Secretary General for Climate Action and former IDB Executive Director for the Caribbean, has made this very point recently, saying we must continue to build momentum towards ambitious outcomes that address the climate crisis. We need all hands on deck to secure a major breakthrough on climate adaptation and resilience building. This panel this afternoon on the blue economy will shed light on some of these points and raise issues that can serve as a guide for countries as they prepare to meet in Glasgow. And now I'm extremely pleased to introduce our distinguished panel who will each bring a different dimension, the global picture, policy, 
technology and finance to this blue economy and resilient discussion. We welcome Jose Diallo, Senior Environmental and Sustainable Development Officer in the Sustainable Development Unit of the Executive Office of the UN Secretary General. Pierre Fayet, Professor of Economics and Director of the Center for Blue Governance at the University of Portsmouth. Claudia Stevenson, Private Sector Lead Specialist in the Competitiveness, Technology and Innovation Division at the IDB. And Lola Fatil Fatolindo, Research Physical Scientist in the Biospheric Sciences Lab at NASA. We will start with Jose. Jose, you've been working in the sustainable development area in both developed and developing countries for quite some time. And you are intimately involved in supporting the negotiations for the UN 2030 agenda. Could you set the context for us this, for this discussion by giving us a global perspective on climate resilience and the role of the blue economy? Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to share something I'm passionate about, although I was born and raised in a city without sea, without seeing the ocean. So the first time I saw it, I, I realized, you know, the opportunities that, that it offers to us. And beyond the ocean, we have a lot of interesting data and numbers. So, for example, 80% of life on Earth is, is there in the ocean. Most of the global transport of goods and are done through the ocean. Before the COVID, 30 million full-time jobs were directly related to the world's ocean. And 3 billion people, the livelihoods of 3 billion people were depending on, on oceans and it was central for them. So basically, uh, I think 2021, and this discussion is quite timely because after COVID, we have been reminded that the health of people is directly related to the health of our planet. And we cannot have a, a healthy planet without a healthy ocean. Uh, and health is intrinsically linked to being resilient. Being climate change, the most threat that we're living today and hopefully will try to solve for future generations. This year, is the, the opportunity to heal people and planet. We have various opportunities in intergovernmental processes to where member states and parties are negotiating. One is the COP26 in Glasgow on climate change, we're gonna talk about. The other one will be in China, it will be the COP15 of the CBD, which is the Convention of Bio Biological Diversity. But in, the, in addition to that, there will be three key events. A food system summit, and uh, I think blue food is one of the key issues that the blue economy can bring to the table. An energy high level dialogue, and we all know the offshore wind potential that we are not harvesting. And also a high level dialogue on energy together with the transport that will be happening in China. This year we have launched two decades, the ocean science decade. There's many data gaps that are avoiding us to take fully advantage of what the ocean offers. And also the decade of ecosystem restorations, which brings opportunities for mitigation, adaptation, and also to mobilize financing. But beyond these big events happening this year, there's also, and I would like to highlight, also ongoing negotiations, which I think are key for the blue economy. In the framework of WTO, there's uh, ongoing discussions about fishing subsidies. One of the SDGs, SDGs 14.1, which is gonna be key. There's also negotiations about the conservation of marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions. And probably next year we'll have a binding legal agreement on that. We also are having different discussions and we, for example, this week, there's a pre-meeting to prepare a ministerial meeting in September to discuss a possible treaty on plastics and, and ocean debris. So there's many things happening, both at the big level, at those negotiations, but also 
on things that can help us on our day to day. For, I would like to highlight a couple of them. For example, UNTAC this year released an ocean street classification, which can help us grasp and understand better, you know, the size and the opportunities of the blue economy. The UN Statistical Commission approved this year natural capital, capital uh, accounting evaluation of ecosystem services as a way for member states, for governments, to really understand how much are we getting from nature. All these uh, will be something that we also will see in 2022 coming together in the Oceans Conference that will be hosted by Portugal, probably around mid-year next year. But we see that there's a lot of potential, but still we're not taking care of oceans. 20% of the mangrove cover is gone. 30% of the global sea grass cover is gone. Every minute we're dumping one garbage track of plastic waves into the oceans and the seas. So, and in relation to the resilience, uh, it's quite striking to see the numbers that we have saying that the cost of the ocean related hazards and is mounting. And it's estimated that by 2050, the global community will face annual cost of over 1 trillion to coastal urban areas as a result of the combined effects of rising sea levels and also extreme weather events on our coastlines. So basically, I think we have, I would like to highlight some key points that will be part of the discussion on COP26. One is how the ocean is the great regulator of climate. It absorbs almost a quarter of the annual emissions that we put on the atmosphere, it captures most of the heat that those emissions have created. We are seeing increasing marine heat waves and most of, of the heat in the atmosphere is similar to the heat in the first couple of meters on, on our ocean. Biodiversity and ecosystems cannot adjust as quickly as these increasing you know, gas emissions are demanding. And we are seeing an acid acidification of all the oceans at very high rates, affecting, for example, coral reefs. We know, you know, coral reefs are the nursery for many fisheries. This is a source of income for tourism. At the current rate on, on carbon emissions, we'll see most of the coral reefs disappear. 99% of will be lost if global temperatures go through the threat line of two degrees and now are currently on a three degrees trend. We also see, as I mentioned, sea level rises accelerating. We're not taking advantage of what mangroves, seagrass meadows and small marshes offer as blue carbon assets. We're seeing human activities like shipping fleets, fishing gears or mining techniques being a challenge for the ocean. And there's good opportunities there to reduce and mitigate and also to adapt. For example, the fishing method of bottom trailing on the seafloor releases more carbon dioxide than the global civil aviation industry that is more talk about. In terms of biodiversity, there's an interesting proposal. Uh, it's called the 30 by 30, which is protecting 30% of the terrestrial, 30% of the marine uh, areas by 2030. And that really is a connection between climate change and biodiversity. There's an opportunity to use not only, you know, technology solutions, but also nature-based solutions, which are normally scalable, much cheaper. We also need to have a look to the land-based human activities, in particular through the source to sea, and many of the contamination and pollution that we have in the sea comes from the land. That requires, you know, having a different look to the government systems that we have and connect the two of them in terms of plastic waste, industrial effluents, 
excess nutrition, and agriculture, fertilizers, or pesticides. And last but not least is climate finance. There's an opportunity to make more blue our financing. There's uh, opportunities for investments. There's opportunities not only to harvest the, the possible mitigation effects on, on carbon, but also to increase the resilience through these techniques. Uh, for example, I would like to put us on the table the example of Barbados, who is now testing not only you know the potential for mangroves to capture carbon but also to increase the resilience of the country and you know do a, an emission of bonds based on that i will stop there and happy to continue the discussion with my colleagues over to you great thank you so much jose i think you've given us a very comprehensive review i think one of the issues that i would like to come back to is the whole issue about how do we move this really forward in a more meaningful way? There are a lot of conferences, a lot of agreements that are going to be um, signed in the future, a lot of activity going on, a lot of possibilities, but we don't seem to be changing the situation much in terms of the degradation of the ocean. So I would like to come back to, to the issue of how do you see this playing out? How can we change the, the, that picture more quickly so that we don't have a serious situation um, on our doorstep, essentially. But I wanted to, to switch now to Pierre, who's gonna give us a sense of the policy perspective, because I think governments are very important. Governments have to really drive this process in a lot of ways, even though the private sector has an important role to play. So Pierre, you've been spending decades um, doing research focusing on sustainable coastal and marine ecosystem management, blue ocean strategies for economic growth. In fact, you've done a lot of work providing the linkage between blue ocean mechanisms and tools and economic growth. Take into account your work at the Center for Blue Governance. Can you tell us what are the most critical policies that are needed to mainstream resilience in the context of the blue economy? I think we're seeing, uh, I think we're seeing Claudia on the screen. So perhaps I need to switch uh, to her right now. Maybe we might be having a little bit of difficulty um, connecting with Pierre. So let me go to Claudia and talk about the role of the private sector. Uh, Jose has outlined a lot of things that are possible. One of the things he mentioned was climate finance. And I know that you've been working at the bank um, with the, the climate uh, department on blue economy projects that promote competitiveness, innovation in the private sector through things like access to finance, improving the business climate, and most importantly, perhaps public and private partnerships. We know that SMEs hold the key to building back better in a post-COVID environment. So how can the private sector advance the resilience and blue economy agenda from your perspective? Okay, uh, thank you, Winston. I'm very happy to be here and share our experiences. Um, Regarding what you mentioned to um, MSMEs, most of the of the uh, activities related to blue economy in our countries are done by, by MSMEs, and um, they usually face uh, the same issues as MSMEs, but um, uh, probably in a harsh, harder way. As as um, um, uh, there's more informality, less access to resources for the type of activities that they, they have been done. But um, also what, what we have seen, um, and I think I want to emphasize this, is that um, what we, we have been, is been happening with the private sector um, in the area of the blue economy is that um, there's kind of a realization that things have to be done in partnership with governments, with civil society, with academia. Um, and, um, and there's, uh, there need to be a, a joint effort, uh, to have a, a, a healthier ocean. Uh, I think the realization that there cannot be a productive ocean, sustainable and sustainable production without, um, the resiliency factor embedded, um, will not be, will not be possible. And, um, I think, um, my colleague um, make the emphasis of um, of uh, how impactful is the can be the ocean economy in the world in terms of of output and in terms of of jobs, um, and then there's the traditional uh, ways of exploiting the ocean like of uh, fishing, uh, coastal tourism, um, aquaculture, 
uh, but there are new potentials that, that we're seeing, especially in, in research, and also the potentials now that you mentioned uh, finance as well, that the uh, coastal ecosystems that are uh, usually mangroves, salt marshes, seagrasses, coral reefs, play a vital role in the overall economy and there's usually this is not being valued in economic terms but there's there's a value um, there in the in the in the economics and and uh, I think um, and also want to emphasize the warning sign that that there's this enormous potential for economic activity but then um, um, there's also a warning sign of, of what's happening in the oceans, especially um, deteriorating of uh, fish stocks due to where fishing, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing. Um, the um, um, what's happening to the coral reefs and the and the wetlands and the mangroves, and and also especially what we do in the bank that we work with the small uh, island states in the Caribbean. Um, they are more dependent on the ocean economy um, and also they have been the hardest hit uh, through COVID. Uh, so uh, many, many of the countries that we are working with, they are um, starting to think about uh, a resilient blue recovery, which includes supporting um, economic activities in, in traditional blue economy, but also thinking about uh, about um, new new ways of, of doing things and on on this um I would like also to um, kind of uh, bring um, a more optimistic uh, perspective of, of what we're seeing happening in the in the countries and um, uh, for example, um, more emphasis on research and innovation on how uh, to make the uh, best use of genetic resources. This is has been an untapped potential, and some countries are are moving forward in that in that area. Um, also, also we've seen, and also my colleague mentioned that the importance of having uh, marine protected areas. Also, we we have seen that countries in the region are starting to move towards this. Um, uh, protection of, of, of areas and this is this is a very um, 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 process it's a process that uh, takes a lot of, of effort uh, in terms of of, um, of doing um, things right of um, doing a, a right ocean mapping um, which is, is is also something that that needs to be uh, is, is an area of, of the ocean that needs to be um, worked more um, and and also um, talking with the communities, um, you know, doing um, not only consultations but agreements on when defining a marine protected area, looking at um, other sources of of um, of, of, uh, of economic sustainable sustenance for the communities when you have a marine protected area. So it it also brings innovation on on new ways of doing things or or new way of using resources. Sometimes those resources are thought about waste, but uh, um, we see entrepreneurs um, and innovators. Um, um, in our region, doing um, marvelous thing about innovations, and um, and and also we've seen, uh, for example, in marine protected areas, also um, a huge emphasis on on doing research and evidence on on having evidence on, on what are the benefits of a marine protected area in the in the in the area. Um, and um, I want to emphasize that uh, uh, innovators and entrepreneurs usually cannot do this by themselves. They um, usually need uh, government support um, and uh, NGO support and community um, supports. And I want to also bring some examples. For example, um, there's a, a new technology um, for processing marine waste from shipping um, that has the support of, of one of the uh, governments in the in the region, um, and also some support. From from donors or from organizations that foster innovation, um, we've seen also countries in the region starting to think about um, uh, the proper management of of the fishing resources and having the correct certifications. Um, I think there's an awareness that um, if you have a, a marine stewardship certification from your fisheries, then you can access uh, not only access new markets, maintain your markets, and maintain your stock. And this is also something that the private sector does 
but the public sector supports in any in any capacity and um, and involves also the community so 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 i just want also to emphasize that that any of these things are not kind of um i think we are starting to think in a win-win situation and collaboration um also joint efforts for coral restoration involving also massive use of data sat um, uh, satellite data um, science um, investigations um, and then um, the communities mm, uh, so uh, and also mm, uh, as part of it we also seeing uh, education campaigns and youth and communities being involved in in advocacy um, so um, um i will i will also want to talk a little bit about uh, blue finance as, as you mentioned and um, also uh, countries in our region are starting to think about um, about the issue of uh, blue bonds and um and knowing that these blue bonds um uh, have to be um aligned with the uh, five tipping points of ocean, the ocean stewardship agenda, uh, sustainable uh, seafood, decarbonized shipping, harnessing the ocean energy, mapping the ocean, and um, ending waste of entering the ocean. And some of the countries that we are working with, they are doing um, uh, uh, with our support uh, policies uh, that are geared towards um, uh, feeding into these uh, five tipping points. So um, that's it, um, over to Great. you. Great, thank you so much, Claudia. You've raised a lot of issues here. That this is a very rich intervention that you made. One of the things that stood out for me was the fact that you now see that while there's a shift away from doing traditional ways of doing things in terms of fishing and going into more sustainability, which comes back to the whole point that you have to balance the drive for economic development, at, certainly at the community level in particular, in these coastal communities with the need to do things sustainably. So at the end of the day, you're preserving the ocean and its resources. I wanted to come back, if you have some time at the end, to the whole discussion about um, climate finance, um, some of the things that the governments are doing in the region, particularly in the Caribbean, where I know you're working um, at the current time, to sort of get some sampling of what sort of projects the bank is working on specifically, so that to give us a, a perspective uh, from the from the region. You also mentioned something about data collection that there's more research being done around innovation, collecting data on preservation and so on. And I wanted to pivot now to Lola to talk about the ways of mobilizing technology to support the blue economy. Lola, you've been studying and gathering data on forest ecology and ecosystems using technology in your current role at NASA. Could you tell us how technology can be used to close knowledge gaps to facilitate mainstreaming of the blue economy uh, resilience uh, arrangement? Yes, absolutely. And it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. It was really um, fascinating listening to both Claudia and Jose earlier to kind of see how all of these things are coming together. So today I'm really excited to talk about um, a little bit more about what my group does um, at NASA Goddard. So really the focus of, of our research, we're going to get a little bit more scientific here, is on the use of Earth observing technology. So specifically um, working with satellite data and um, satellite imagery to really um, work on the generation of um, land cover maps and ecosystem extent maps. And this helps us really better understand the processes and vulnerabilities with the focus here on the coastal zone, but could also be done on a, on a countrywide level. So the, the, the type of work that we've been doing is really focused on using satellite imagery and other spaceborne data to, to better map um, uh, coastal ecosystems and in particular blue carbon ecosystems. So mangroves, salt marshes, and also seagrass is something that we're getting into. And we're, we're interested in doing this in two dimensions in three dimensions and also what we call four dimensions. So essentially we make maps which are in two dimensions, three dimensions, meaning that we actually look at the structure or the three 
three-dimensional um, extent, so a height of a, of a forest, for example, or the depth of the coastal zone. This gives us some, some better understanding of the type of ecosystem, um, also the type of changes and drivers, and also carbon storage in these ecosystems. And then what I mean by 4D is that we're looking at this over time. So we, we do analysis of what has happened in the past because that helps us better understand what might happen in the future and also some of the interventions or changes that may have happened that are working or that are not working. Um, so today I'll talk a little bit about some of um, our, our biggest highlights or some of the lessons learned and some of the results that we found um, on our studies with really a focus primarily on mangrove ecosystems, which is what we've been, we've been monitoring um, extensively. So as an example, I would mention that I work with satellite imagery. We now have satellite imagery um, at 30 meter resolution um, globally that, is that has been available for over three decades, in some areas even four decades. So we can go back into the early 70s and really better understand what was there then, because that then gives us a better understanding of what's here now. But really, the, the main reason why we're interested and so focused on having better maps is because if you're trying to do interventions, if you're trying to plan projects and you're trying to plan in general, um, you need to really have a good understanding of what's on the ground. And I'm just thinking here about, you know, this first um, intervention that you mentioned earlier when you had the five main points and the first one was restoration and protection. And one thing that we always think about is you, you can't protect what you don't know that you have. You know, you need to know what you have before you know how to protect it. And similarly, you also really need to have a better idea of what you have on the ground, for example, where mangroves are and what has been the main driver of change or loss in, in particular of mangroves before you're able to really plan for protection or plan for restoration. And this is something that we're kind of seeing on a global scale um, looking at our maps of mangroves, we recently um, produced a, a global map of mangrove loss drivers. So looking at what is the rate of change, where is the change happening, and what is the main cause of this change? Is it due to human influences or is it due to natural influences? And, and so by human, we mean direct human, like cutting or felling or um, conversion for aquaculture or um, urbanization and so on. And by natural, we mean things like erosion or um, extreme events like hurricanes and cyclones. Um, and now, you know, there's kind of this mix of both the climate driven um, and natural causes. So here we see the example of sea level rise, for example, which might be a natural process, but one that is really being, um, that is really advancing uh, faster due to climate change. And so just to provide an example of how our maps and this technology can help in planning for interventions, um, what we found, for example, on a global scale is when we think of mangrove loss, oftentimes we think, you know, this is directly caused by human conversion to something else or human uses. Um, but what we found is that over time, since the early 2000s, actually the conversion of mangroves um, uh, changes in laws and increased protection has actually resulted in a decrease of mangrove losses um, due to direct human causes globally um, and an increase of the proportion of those uh, losses from so-called natural causes. So here I'm thinking of um, hurricanes, um, sea level rise and erosion. And so this is really important when you're planning some type of intervention because you really need to know what the main cause is, what the main driver is. If it's a human cause driver, then you will have very different intervention than when you have um, an erosion cause driver, for example. Similarly, if you're planning restoration, for example, you need to know whether you will, to give an example, whether you're planning a restoration that involves planting of trees, or is it a restoration that might involve um, really uh, restoring the, the water flow or the hydrology or protection that will then result in, in natural erosion. So these are some of the things that really satellite technology is, is allowing us to do um, to really better analyze these changes. Um, and, and what I think is really important here is also to know that um, this is something that now can be done um, on large scales, um, essentially by any country. The data is available, the technology is available, the computing power and the algorithms are available. So we can now actually monitor our resources in ways that we couldn't before. And almost any country can do this on an operational way. 
Um, another really important um, factor that I think is to, to think about here, which was also mentioned earlier by Claudia, is, is the importance of, of um, the collaboration and the uh, getting scientists to work with policymakers to really better understand what the priorities are, because this allows us as scientists to know, okay, what should we focus on um, in when we're looking at our next questions or when we're doing our analysis. Great, thank you so much, Lola. I have follow-up questions for you, but I think I'm gonna to pivot to Pierre. Hopefully we can get him now on the, on the screen and I'll come back to you in the discussion session because I've got some interesting questions for you. Thank you. Um, I think we've lost. Here, I'm not sure what's going on. So, okay, I'll, let's go to the follow-up questions. Okay, so, um, Claudia, let me start with you. Could you give us some examples of some of the projects you've done in the Caribbean around the blue economy, just to sort of contextualize things a little bit? I know you've talked in generalities and your, your examples were great, but I'd like to sort of come down to the micro level a little bit and, and give us some real life examples, please. Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you. Yes, um, uh, I, I want to highlight the, the uh, work that we have been doing in the Bahamas and it's been um, um, sort of um, long, long term. Um, and we started um, with uh, what we call a technical cooperation to support Support um, doing an, an action plan for the blue economy. And of, of these, some uh, policy reforms came into light. Um, and, this, and, and we uh, supported the initiatives of, of the government to do these uh, policy reforms. Uh, we support them in, in two ways. One, with, with um, technical resources to support informed policy making and the other one was um, um, with with resources to, to the government directly so so um, uh, I guess um, like in an ideal world you start with some dialogue on technical issues and then you move into into uh, into the reforms that need to be need to be done. In this case, um, I think one of the issues to highlight uh, in this case was um, it was not only around the, the blue economy, but the institutional framework. And, and I think we haven't mentioned that, and, and I guess that will be part of of, of peers about policy. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it was kind of fundamental to have the institutions, the correct institutions in place. In this case, it was a stronger um, institutional framework for uh, the environmental management, including the uh, Ministry of, of Environment, the Department of Environmental Planning, um, all the institutions, NGOs, the funds, everybody, you know, there was kind of a, a huge um, uh, improvement and modernization of, of the framework, including, uh, for example, uh, better um, uh, ways to have accountability on environmental impact assessments. Which, which, and, and in the Bahamas, I think uh, everything is almost blue. Like any 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 activity that you do will affect the ocean. So, so there was this this huge effort that that we were fortunate and 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 happy uh, to support to have uh, an important. Um, um, uh, institutional framework and we are now on kind of on the on the I will say the second derivative or the third derivative of this joint support which is we are working on what we call um, policy-based guarantee in which we um, have identified also a set of, of policy actions um, and work together with the government and that will uh, eventually become a guarantee for the emission of a bond. We don't think it will be a blue bond yet, but all the activities, as I mentioned, are, um, are related to the five tipping points of a, of a blue bond. So they're strengthening their, their areas of, of related to, to, to the blue tip tipping points. And what we found while doing this is, okay, this is not only government, really, uh, there are private actors here as well. Uh, not not actually, uh, you know, creating policy or doing laws, but actually doing the work, which has been very, very interesting. And uh, 
other parts that, that I think has, are relevant to talk about and is also related to, to institutions and collaboration is the need to have monitoring and evaluation of policy in which the area of data comes uh, into place. Um, I think there's been a lot of progress, as, as, as was mentioned before, on having access to satellite data and, and other types of data, but still um, there are lots of data gaps for informed um, um, decision making, um, like in terms of ocean pollution or, you know, uh, things that are not that easy to be to be measured, especially also to the nature of the ocean, like what 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 is really affecting the ocean in, for example, the Bahamas due to the actions of the Bahamas, or what is not completely related and is just on a small islands that get that gets uh, affected by what others are doing. Um, but um, I'm, I'm just saying that the issue of, of of data and the monitor and evaluation to see um, also the effects of a policy, but also you know what what is account what can be be accountable for the country and what is outside of it. It's important and, and we are working on that. And I think also the other part that we are working and with this I'll finish um, and the whole Caribbean region is to have policy dialogue on the blue blue economy. And we had um, a, what we call a regional policy dialogue in which one a participant to of each one of the Caribbean countries related to blue economy. One, it was actually there were more because it was virtual, and we only don't, didn't only had governments, but also um, uh, academia and other stakeholders to discuss their own experiences and have a space for for sharing experiences and also bringing some um, like a state of the art. Uh, um, uh, uh, issue in this case, our last dialogue we had a prospective technological analysis of what's happening on the blue economy in the world, and what could be applied for the Caribbean, and had a discussion on that. So, so I, I guess in a nutshell, we do uh, um, some sort of um, uh, very different levels of of of, of uh, actions. One is to generate knowledge; the other is to generate dialogue, and. Um, and then to do support for policies and support informed decision making and the support we do it either by directly um, doing technical assistance or by uh, supporting the government on the achievements on the uh, reforms in the right direction. Great, I'm glad you're dealing with the policy aspect because that's so important because the, the policy will form the framework for the private sector to actually do activities and so on. I will come back to you a little bit later about the community aspect, because I think that's also important. Mm -hmm. Let me turn to Jose now, because you've laid out a really ambitious set of programs that are actually happening at the international level. Um, but I was struck by something you said. You said, in spite of all this going on, countries are signing agreements, there are going to be conferences, there are several decades that have been proclaimed. There is still the issue, the thorny issue, of the fact that we're not moving fast enough. So uh, just to get your thoughts on how can we accelerate the process in your mind? Well, I think we have many ways. Um, although successful climate action is not a collection of silver bullets. Mm -hmm. It requires an iterative process of communicating, collaborating, yeah. self-evaluation sometimes that is hard and also be open-minded to exploration and listen to science and, and evidence. Um, I think it will depend on, on each country, but there's definitely things that are happening and, and we can see it's possible. We saw the revolution that meant, for example, most countries banding you know, plastic bags and many uh, countries in the region leading on that and, and others taking another step and banning, for example, the use of single-use uh, plastics. Now we have a key opportunity because uh, countries need to go uh, to Glasgow to COP26 with new national determined contributions, which are more ambitious, basically saying how they're gonna contribute to the fight to climate change. So I think we need the blue lenses to inform those uh, proposals. And we, it's quite ambitious, we collectively need to achieve a 45% decrease in the emissions by 2030 relatively to 2020 levels to keep us below the 1.5 degree threshold and, and keep it shade. But I think there's these things that we can start doing already. I mentioned, for example, the idea of the natural capital, capital accounting 
So growth is not measured or well-being not measured by GDP, but value all the things. Uh, I think that definitely the, the idea of grasping the, the opportunities native solutions provide in mangroves is a great one. And um, the issue of financing is quite, is quite interesting. And have you, you probably have seen many countries moving into defining taxonomies for sustainable finance, some of them in our region, some of them in other regions, the Europeans, the Chinese. Uh, Chinese is set to, to launch uh, uh, the carbon market in the 1st of July, starting with, a, uh, with coal uh, plants, but probably increasing. You have seen the G20 upgrading the sustainable finance study group now into a working group. And um, G7, for example, acknowledging the work of the task force of nature-based disclosures in terms of, you know, following the path of on climate change in terms of, you know, which kind of disclosure data risk financial institutions will be have to look at. So I think there's a lot of things in terms of not only legislation, but action by the private sector, particularly on finance, that would be very useful to have a look at. And, uh, and there I would like to mention also that the regional component is key. So building back better, particularly for the blue economy, requires regional collaboration, so regional collaboration. And we have already platforms we could use, for example, the regional seas. Or if we want to have marine protected areas, we have to connect them. It cannot be in isolation. So I think definitely an opportunity for uh, for a regional collaboration and not only having a, you know, my country mindset only. Thank you. That's very important. Thanks so much, Jose. Um, I'll come back to you again in a little bit, but let me pivot now to Lola. You said a very, you said something very interesting about given the map, the satellite maps available, any country can actually access this data and use it. Could you give us some idea about how to do that and what tools are available? Sure. So uh, when I'm talking about this, I, I, you know, talking specifically about NASA data, for example, NASA satellite data, we now have 30 or more Earth observing satellites orbiting the planet. This is from NASA alone. And then there's all the other um, in, you know, international space agencies and space systems and also commercial data. So there's really a wealth of data available. Um, much of that is commercial, so you have to buy it. So there often there is kind of a, a threshold or some limit to what can be done. But when working with NASA data in particular, for example, all of our data is free, freely available. And so I think there one of the one of the limiting factors of the data is, you know, being able to use it is having the, the capacity essentially to analyze the data. But now with the avenue of cloud computing, there's a lot of open source data sets, a lot of open source um, programming languages and analysis packages that are allowing people to actually use the data in um, operational or semi-operational way. So earlier I was talking about a, a satellite program called Landsat. So this one is primarily geared towards you know, land resources, but it's, it's very useful in the coastal zone still. This is what we've been working with for, for mangrove mapping, for example. Um, there's other data sets that are, um, that, that there's a satellite called ISAT2, for example, and I'm getting into details here, but it's, it's data that is allowing us to do things that we didn't think were available. This one can be used for bathymetry, for example, which is really important when you're looking at the coastal zone, especially the shallow coastal zone, to get a better understanding of what your resources are there. Um, and then I think what, what's been happening now is that many of the techniques that have been developed over the past 10, 20, 30 years when it comes to satellite data analysis are now becoming more user friendly. So we're really trying to work on how can we actually make this data usable so that it can get into the hands of all of you here so that it can actually be used. Mm -hmm. Great. I think also aren't there private companies? Because I think I, I listened to one of the sessions yesterday on, on small businesses and, how, what, and their relationship to the, the uh, climate issue. And I think there were several companies that were mentioned that are doing, that are actually in the satellite drone business related to ecosystem mapping and so on, agriculture and other applications. Absolutely, and many yeah. companies are using a lot of the scientific, a lot of the the um, 
the resources that have been developed and actually applying them in a more commercial way. Um, right. Right, but of course your your data is available free, so their advantage is in in actually tapping into what NASA has to offer. I would think. Yeah, I think it's it is still important though for the and and, and really useful to have the private enterprises being able to use the data and analyze it because oftentimes, like I was mentioning, the uses that uh, this enterprise might have is not going to be the same as what I'm doing for as a scientist, and the data should be used um, for for all of these applications. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Lola. Okay, I'm going to pivot back to Claudia and ask you to talk about the community level aspect, because I do believe that you touched a little bit on the education aspect, saying that, you know, there's a lot of um, mobilization going on at the community level, and there has to be a partnership between the government, the private sector, and the community around resilience. So I wondered if within the projects that you're looking at in the Caribbean and you've been involved in, whether there has been any partnerships with community groups or whether you're partnered with other, with foundations, NGOs, who are actually at the ground level working on some of these issues. Yes, uh, thank you for, for these questions. Um, okay, I think I want to start with saying that all the policy uh, regulations that, that we supported had to be um, consulted with, with stakeholders. And, um, and, uh, and of course, during COVID, there was the issue of, of, of not being able to do that in person. And in, for example, countries like the Bahamas, where um, there's it's an archipelago and uh, there are issues with transportation, it was harder. But uh, actually, uh, there had to be like a force to make it uh, uh, digitally. Uh, but uh, there was an emphasis, of course, uh, at the bank to uh, have uh, consultations with, with everything. And, and yes, and we're seeing also uh, as, as, as I think Jose mentioned, the government um, uh, sets up the framework, the regulations, and um, and and also one of the things we are seeing is a very very strong activities of of communities in, in several levels, um, um, NGOs uh, participating in partnership with the government or in or in or in several capacities in uh, in uh, moving forward some of of these uh, initiatives for example in marine protected areas and uh, also uh, strong involvement of communities in 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 er, in for example uh, policies to promote the marine protected areas or ban of plastics for example i think the, the example of the bahamas is very interesting which was the community and the civil society who um, jointly with academia were the forces that um, um, uh, supported the um, ban of plastics which became a law so um, I, I think we we've seen it in in several capacities in several uh, levels and um, and um, and uh, and yeah communities are always always involved Mm, great. Just another another quick question for you um, before I move on. The whole notion of micro and small businesses. You know, I know the bank has been doing a lot of work around business climate, around developing the ecosystem for innovation. Um, are you closing the circle, so to speak? Because obviously these small businesses are to some extent engaged in the blue economy as well. So are you closing the circle with providing them with the support and so on to enable them to actually participate meaningfully in the blue economy yes well when you mentioned you i will say the bank uh, uh, <laughs> that's what i meant obviously yeah yeah and um yes and we we do it in in several instances i think we have this program that many of you may know compete caribbean which has a focus on of promoting innovation and and growth of MSMEs in the blue economy. And uh, the project that we are doing uh, currently in the Bahamas, we're looking at the business climate issues of the blue economy, which are different uh, because, um, you know, some things that uh, any other business have to do, uh, just go uh, and take a taxi to do a uh, process. Uh, if you live in an island, it's a different story. So we are looking at that too. Um, and the particular issues of, of business climate in blue economy as well. Great. 
Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to ask, I think we're winding down now to the end of the session. So I'm going to ask each of you the same question, basically to identify two or three priorities vis-a-vis -vis resilient and the blue economy that countries ought to focus on, highlight in the COP26. I'll start with Jose. Well, that's a, that's a good. <laughs> <laughs> a good question, but maybe uh, I think three words. I think the ambition is the first one. And as I mentioned, the new round of NDCs is, should be a place to reflect the potential that the blue economy reflects. I think at the same time, we're going to COP26, you have to have a multi sector, multi level vision. So it's, you know, when you negotiate, Think about your cities, cities about your communities, about the different sectors across the economy, the different ministries. So I think that would be the, the second point that I think countries need to, to grasp. And I think the third one is to, to, to keep open your mind and learn from both sides and what others are doing. And, um, and I think there's a lot of opportunities, there's a lot of data, a lot of evidence, but sometimes we work in, in silos. So I think the, what the global community offers uh, today is, is Wikipedia, is not more than Encyclopedia Britannica. When you look and, and someone tells you what to do, is there's many people contributing and we can learn from that. Great, thank you so much. Lola, what are your two or <laughs> three? You issues um I, I think i'm you know relating to the type of work that i do um continued investment in um, regular monitoring and um mapping and scientific um work investment in general is something that i can think about and really thinking um, further about um, what jose mentioned earlier when he was talking about natural capital accounting and how that can really be incorporated into um, some of these priorities. Great, thank you. Claudia. Okay, I'll be very quick. Um, I'll say partnerships uh -huh. in, all the, in all the dimensions of partnership, uh, blue innovation and blue technology and um, sustainable economic activity. Great, thank you so much. Well, I think um, I'm going to, tr I can't really sum up the conversation. It's been very rich, but I just wanted to um, highlight some things that resonated for me. First of all, um, this is a huge task ahead. Um, there's a sense of urgency in terms of being able to address the blue economy challenges that lie ahead. I, I want to go back to Jose's points that he made just now about the focus and the perspective that countries need to have going into COP26 and indeed any other um, conference around the blue economy. I think the whole notion of ambition being very bold and um, thinking outside the box in terms of possibilities is important. The multilateral vision is important. Not only that, but also dovetailing with that, the whole notion of, of partnerships. And I come back to Claudia's point that she made in her intervention, talking about collaboration as being important at all levels, not only between the public sector and private sector, but also NGOs and the communities as well. So that is something obviously that needs to, to be carried forward um, in a COP26 discussion. Um, Lola talked a lot about mapping and I was very struck by the fact that there's a lot of possibilities for data collection. Um, certainly the information is there if countries are willing to tap into to those resources. Obviously, um, meaningful ecosystem preservation around the blue economy um, only makes sense if you actually know what your situation is, you own it, and then you can move forward and figure out solutions. So I think the whole notion of countries tapping into um, what NASA can offer in terms of resources and linking scientists with the policymakers, community organizers, NGOs, and so on, and certainly the private sector would be very important. Um, finally, I think that 
certainly the bank itself is doing an awesome job in terms of mobilizing support for countries at all levels in Latin America and the Caribbean. I think there's a lot that can be learned between countries. Um, there are non exchanges and the possibilities for that are, are very important. Jose mentioned that as well, saying that you should keep an open mind going into the COP26, see what others are doing, and by extension, try to, to get access to some other information, share experiences and best practices and lessons. So I think um, this has been a very, very rich conversation. Um, I want to thank, again, our panelists for participating in this discussion. Um, I, I think that we somehow missed Pierre. I'm, I'm sorry that he couldn't join us, that he had difficulties. He would have brought a new perspective and some interesting comments to the discussion. But again, thank you so much. Thank you to the audience as well, and have a good evening. <laughs>